A friend texted me the other day, a, a fellow minister, and she said, Troy, I am so tired of Lent. I said, you know what? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. There's a sense in which if Lent is not wearing on you in some way, then perhaps you need to dig in a little deeper. Lent is not designed as a happy time, as a, as a joyful time. Lent is not rainbows and puppy dogs. It's storm clouds and yellow jackets. It's dark and dreary, dreary and lonely and bleak. Lent is a wilderness time. And we've now spent six weeks in the wilderness, and I don't know about you, but I, I'm ready to follow the breadcrumbs out of here. Now, Palm Sunday can perk us up a little bit. Uh, joyfully waving palm branches around can, can give us a taste of what's to come, and it's tempting to, to just stick with that. When I was a kid, I used to love to read choose-your-own-adventure books. If you were a kid in the 70s or 80s, I, I bet you remember choose-your-own-adventure books. They may still make them, I don't know. But I used to be addicted to them. I love to read these books. Each of these, these stories are written in the second person so that you are the main character and you get to determine how the story unfolds. Every time you reach some decision point, you get a choice. If you want to open the door to the secret passageway, turn to page 11. If you want to turn around and go home, turn to page 13. As a kid who had no real meaningful responsibility or authority, it was great to pretend I was in control, at least for a little while. And of course, you didn't like the way it turned out. You could always flip back a few pages and do it over again until you got it right. Well, this day in the church has become sort of a, a choose-your-own liturgy day. For generations, for centuries, this last Sunday in Lent has been known as Palm Sunday, where children wave palm fronds. We remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But for the last 20, 25 years or so, there, there's been sort of a shift in the way that churches celebrate. Uh, some churches choose to celebrate Palm Sunday. Others choose to recognize Passion Sunday. It just has to do with the way our culture has changed. A generation or two ago, folks would come to all sorts of different Holy Week services. Maundy Thursday on, on, in the evening to remember the Last Supper. Good Friday to remember the cross. And, you know, the traditional Good Friday service lasted three hours from noon to three. Now, in a world where, where families have more than one parent working, where kids have all sorts of evening activities, we're, we're just busier than we used to be. And, and the bottom line is this, not that many people show up for Holy Week services anymore. Uh, they, they just don't have that many come. I'm not trying to start a conversation about how great the good old days were and things ain't like what they used to be. I'm not doing any of that. It's not judgment. It's, it's just reality. It's just the world we live in. And because of that reality, many of us can go right on through Holy Week without ever having heard anything about the cross. Now, you come on Palm Sunday, watch the kids process, we, we hear about the triumphal entry, entry and, and then we come back on Easter and Jesus is raised and all is right with the world. If you just have those two bookends, you, you miss the Last Supper, you miss the washing of the feet, you, you miss the trial, you miss the cross. We go from triumph to triumph. We still end up at Easter, but it matters how you get there. You might have heard the, the old one about a rural family doctor who had three patients and he wanted to determine the, the right amount of uh, medicine for each of them, trying to get the doses right. And he asked the first patient, said, sir, what's five plus five? He said, it's 157. I said, well, we're gonna have to change your dosage. He goes to the next one, what's five plus five? Thursday. I'll have to change your dosage too. It goes to the third and, and, and says, what's five plus five? And he said, well, it's 10, of course. Before getting too excited, the doctor said, well, well how did you get that figure? He said, well, I subtracted Thursday from 157. It matters how you get there. This is why your math teacher always told you to show your work. It matters how you get there. And the simple fact is this, without death, there can be no resurrection. Without a cross, there is no empty tomb. The old life must end for new life to begin. And we may not like that very much. Robert Capon maintains that the, the typical American paradigm of the Messiah isn't Jesus, it's Superman. We don't want a Savior who does a, a silly thing like rising from the dead, he says. We want one who never dies. But our Savior does die. Our Savior does die, and we cannot experience the joy of Easter if we do not come to terms with the reality of Jesus' death. It matters how you get there. 
There's a scene in that, that old movie, The Lion in Winter, where, where death seems imminent, and Prince Richard says, they'll get no satisfaction out of me. They aren't going to see me beg. And Prince Geoffrey responds, you fool, as if it matters how one fell down. And Prince Richard says, when the fall is all there is, it matters. When the fall is all that's left, it matters a great deal. It matters how you get from, from the waving of the palms to shouts of crucify. It matters how you get from Hosanna to Golgotha. It matters how you get to Easter. And the truth is, you, you can't get from Palm Sunday to Easter without taking a long, hard look in the mirror. A few years ago, I, I learned the story of a guy named John B. McLeborn. You, you may have heard it too. There was a a popular podcast about him at the time. John B. McLemore was a fellow from, from Woodstock, Alabama, Bibb County, Alabama, a little, little, little town. And one day he writes to a reporter about a possible murder in this little town and a cover-up. And the reporter comes down to Alabama to check it out, but it turns out that there was not a murder and therefore there was not a cover-up and that this guy John is just completely nuts, just, just, just off his rocker. He's brilliant and he's curious and, he, and he's compassionate, but, but shifting from, from mania to depression and over and over and over again. And so instead of a story about a murder, the reporter starts to write a story about John. And John would be the first to tell you that he was manic and depressed and distressed. And he would say it was all because of this town he lived in, this world he lived in. He, he's worried about the climate and the education system and, and child abuse. He's worried about kids who, who grow up in Woodstock and have no real options in life, no, no resources to, to stand up in this horrible place, this, this horrible world. This guy has, has, has a very bleak outlook, but it wasn't how horrible he thought Woodstock was and, or, or how awful he thought Alabama was or, or how destined for destruction he thought our world may be. What really distressed John was the lack of outrage in the world compared to how awful it was. That others could see the very same things that, that he saw and then just be okay with it. That lack of outrage outraged him. So he calls down the reporter to investigate this possible murder. And, and, and what it was, a son of a prominent family had been going around saying he beat another guy to death. Beat him to death. And the police hadn't done anything about it. And dozens of people had heard about it. And it turned out not to be true. There was a fight, but nobody died. And so there wasn't any kind of cover-up. But here's the thing. Plenty of people believed there had been a murder, believed there had been a cover-up, and still just didn't do anything. Just a shrug of the shoulders. Oh, well, that's just the way it goes around here. And that's what was driving John crazy, this, this, this resignation, this numb acceptance that we can't change things. People thought there was a murder and a cover-up, and their response was, oh, well, it's just the way it goes. It's one of the prayers uh, of Harry Emerson Fosdick's uh, great hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. There was yet another shooting in the news this week. Last week it was Atlanta, this week it's Boulder. And every time there's a shooting we get a little outraged for a few days, but before long things will go back to normal. If history gives us any indication of what's to come, we'll keep shrugging our shoulders and saying that's just the way it goes. And we don't do that just with guns. We can talk about education or, or immigration or poverty or homelessness or racism and hate. Bring any of it up. And it is almost always met with that same shrug of the shoulders. It's awful. But it's just the way it goes. They greeted him like a king. Throwing their cloaks in the ground, throwing palms out into the street, shouting and singing loud hosannas. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. On Sunday, they cheered and they cheered and they sang songs of praise as, as their hope was lifted. But by Friday afternoon, when the world went black and their king cried out in pain, well, they cried and they mourned. They, they were filled with sadness and grief. But then they went back home and said, I guess that's just the way it goes. Folks, we can't get from Palm Sunday to Easter without taking that long, hard look in the mirror. Where we will see, if we can keep ourselves from turning away, we will see that we can't escape the wilderness. We aren't just in the wilderness, the wilderness is in us too. 
The wilderness of fear and doubt, temptation and complacency, our weak resignation to the evil we deplore. It goes with us wherever we go. For most of us, it doesn't take this shape of evil on any kind of grand scale. It's simply resignation. It is an acceptance of the status quo. It's a lack of hope. It's a lack of imagination. But folks, a lack of imagination is really a lack of faith. Because faith is the enduring ability to imagine life a different way. Faith is the vision to see it doesn't have to be like this. This is not just the way it goes. God has something different in mind for us, something more. And so Jesus calls us to keep our eyes open, to to watch as the story unfolds from from today's parade to Thursday's supper to From a friend's betrayal to a rigged trial, from the cross to the tomb, Jesus says, keep your eyes open and see it. See it all. Open your eyes and and you will see, you'll see that the powers of the world are no match for the power of love. You'll see that light still shines in the darkness. You'll see that death will lose its sting. Open your eyes and, and look in the mirror and see yourself exactly as you are. See the wilderness in your heart, the the weak resignation in your spirit, the the fear and the doubt, the loneliness. It's all there, but that's not all that's there. See with it the image of your creator. See in that mirror a child of God knitted together in love and filled with the breath of heaven. We can't get from Palm Sunday to Easter without taking a long, hard look in the mirror. So look in that mirror and see yourself as you are, broken and holy, scared and sacred, fearful and faithful, but most of all, beloved. Friends, it is for you that Jesus walks this journey. It is for you that Jesus shows what love makes possible. From the cradle to the cross, it is all for you. So open your heart. Open your eyes and prepare the way of the Lord.